Hello everyone, welcome to Business 255. This is Dr. Matt C. Howard again, and this is your second lecture of week one. Um, I, as you can see, I put the date there is January 10th, because I assume you're going to watch this on Thursday, but it might be Wednesday, it might be Friday. Regardless, this is your second video of week one. Okay. Today we're going to uh, review some things you probably should have known from last semester, you probably should know from your uh, prior statistics class. Um, and that's going to primarily be descriptive statistics and p-values. You should probably already know both of these concepts. If you don't, that's okay. We'll review them today. You can get a refresher. Um, but I'm assuming you know at least a little bit about these concepts already. Okay, so let's go ahead and start the review. So the first thing you should know about this class, or the first question you should ask in this class, is what exactly is statistics? Um, that term is thrown a lot, around a lot. It means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. But for this class, statistics, part of it is extracting useful information from numerical data. It's extracting things we want to know, things we need to know, from numerical data that we collect. The numerical data could be something that's objective, like how many accidents happened at a factory, how many uh, products did the factory produce, how much revenue did a company generate, but it might be things that are a little bit more subjective. Um, so often in business research, we get employees to complete uh, surveys. The surveys might say on a scale from one to seven, how happy are you? On a scale from one to seven, how good of an employee are you? And we can do statistics with those answers. The people write a one, two, three, four, whatever they write down, and we can analyze what well, does what they write down relate to something else? Does what they write down relate to other things that they wrote down? So we can extract useful information from numerical data. Also, statistics, we make inferences about a population from a representative sample. Um, so these are terms you should have already encountered in your prior statistics course. So a population is the entire group that we're interested in, the entire uh, group of people that we want to know more about. So if we're doing business research, we might be interested in all employees ever. If we're just interested in doing consulting work with a particular company, our population might just be the employees at that particular company. And then the other term in that answer is sample. So a sample is just a subset of your population. It's just a smaller group that you take from your population. And we typically perform statistics using the sample because the population is way too big. And also another thing you should know about what is statistics is to many statistics is a concept that cannot be fully described until you understand statistics itself. So right now it might be kind of hard to completely understand well what is statistics, but hopefully by the end of the semester, hopefully by the time you know more analyses, you know more what to do, you'll understand how to answer this question better. And there's a pretty good chance this question will come back and be on a test at the end of the semester. Just FYI. Okay. So why do we need statistics? What is the purpose of t statistics? Now there's a lot of different answers you could give to this question. So we need statistics to draw meaningful inferences from observations. So often in business we observe things, we see that things have happened, maybe our company revenue has increased, maybe it's gone through the floor, maybe it's just going up and down and we have no idea why. We need statistics to help us understand what's going on. Why do these changes happen? Can we measure something that predicts these changes? Or do these changes predict something else? Statistics can help us with that. And then related to that, statistics, we use them to make informed decisions. So after we collect that data, after we might perform some analyses to figure out, well, why is our revenue going up and down? We can then make informed decisions based on those statistics, based on the numbers, based on those results, that we got from the observations. Sometimes these results confirm our beliefs. Sometimes we already had something that we really knew really strongly, but we need the numbers to be completely sure about it. And often more importantly, we need the, the numbers to convince other people about it. Just because you have a strong feeling often in business doesn't mean anything. We have to have some type of data, some type of result to convince other people what you feel, what you think is true. And that's why we need statistics. But other times we need statistics to reject our beliefs. There's so many times in consulting, there's so many times that I've worked with companies that the company has felt so strongly about something 
They hire me to do the analysis to prove their point, and then they're completely wrong. They have nothing, they knew nothing about the process, they had nothing that was correct, but they needed statistics to show them, well, what is going on? What do we really need to know? So sometimes statistics reject our beliefs. And then also we need statistics to further science. Across every scientific field of study, you're going to see statistics. So if you ever want to do research, if you ever want to do science, you need to know statistics. And then sometimes most importantly, statistics keeps us from believing stupid things. That all the time people throw out stupid ideas, stupid hypotheses, and you can't argue against it unless you can have data, unless you can have results that refute their points. So often statistics keeps us from believing stupid things. Okay, so think about these examples. Um, so how can statistics help us with the following? So after a record amount of snow, a newspaper headline read, what global warming? So think about that for a second. And as you probably guessed, statistics could be used to collect data, or you could collect data on temperatures across years, temperatures across months, temperatures across days, and then you could perform some analyses to see, well, is the trend still going up? Is global warming still happening? Even though there might have been a single dip where the temperature got colder, where we had a single bad snowstorm, but does that mean that on average there is no global warming? And the answer is, it's hard to tell. Um, you can have dips even though the temperature is steadily going up, so therefore you could have global warming just because you had a snowstorm. But you need the data, you need the statistics to support that. Another uh, example is a gambler predicts the next roll of a dice will be a 7 because the last three rolls were not a 7. So think about how statistics could help you with that. And as you probably guessed, statistics is heavily involved with probability. You often have to think about the logic of probability when you're doing statistics. And as you also probably guessed, just because the last three rolls of a dice were a seven, if it's a fair dice, have n has no impact on what the future dice roll will be. So if I have a fair dice, no matter what I rolled in the past, has no effect on what I rolled in the future. And statistics can help us understand why that's the case. And we might talk about that further in the semester. Okay. Other things you should know about statistics, just as a part of your review, is statistics are an integral part of the scientific process. So in the scientific process, we create a hypothesis, and whenever you perform analyses, you have to have some type of a hypothesis. Um, often you don't even realize you have a hypothesis when you're doing the analysis, but it's there. there. You have something that you're testing. You have some type of relationship you want to know more about. So you have some type of hypothesis. It might be really simple, it might just be that x is related to y, but that's still a hypothesis. Then as part of the scientific process, you collect your data. So you think of an experiment, you think of some way you can observe something. It might be a survey, it might be a true experiment where you manipulate, manipulate variables, or it might be something else altogether. But somehow you collect your data and you try to make it numerical in some way. Whether it's observing how many times something happened, whether it's counting something, or whether it's getting people to respond to a survey on a 1 to 7 scale. Once you have that data, you then analyze your data. So that's going to be the focus of this course, because this is, this is a statistics course. We're really going to focus on how do you analyze your data, how do you take whatever you collected, whatever observations you have, and actually get results from them. And then you report your results. You're going to write up your results. We're not going to focus on that as much in this course, but if you ever take, uh, or if you ever enroll in the MBA program at South Alabama, I do teach the stats class in the MBA program, and we talk about reporting results over and over and over and over again. Uh, in the MBA program here for my stats course, most of the homework assignments are papers, because I expect you to not only do the analysis, but I expect you to write it up and report the results in a manner that others can understand. Not so much for this course, but if you continue your education, that's what you should expect. And then you repeat the process. The scientific process is never completed. We always want to replicate our results, so you, then you repeat the process. And also you should know, even in practical applications, the function of statistics is very similar. That even when you're doing practice, even if you're consulting with someone, you approach, the sci or you approach your research questions in a very, very, very similar manner. Okay. 
So where do we start to learn more about statistics? As you probably guessed, today we're going to start with uh, talking about descriptive statistics, and we're going to get some initial ideas about what are inferential statistics, which you probably should have encountered that term already, but if not, that's okay. So descriptive statistics just provide a summary of your data. Descriptive statistics typically just do analyses with a th single variable, and it just gives you a summary of that variable. It gives you a feel of what's the shape of that variable, what does that variable look like, what's going on with that variable, so it just gives you a summary of the data for that variable. And descriptive statistics include mean, median, mode, variance, standard deviation, and even things like skew. Um, I expect you to have already encountered mean, median, and mode. You probably encountered that as early as third grade. But I also expect you to have encountered variance and standard deviation in your prior stats course. So once again, descriptive statistics just provide a summary of your data. On the other hand, inferential statistics infer relationships between data. Inferential statistics infer relationships between data. And inferential statistics include things like correlation, regression, t-test of NOVA, so on and so on. So inferential statistics typically involve more than one variable. It might include two, it might include three, so on and so on. And you're typically looking for some type of relationship between those variables. Um, it's typically something you cannot easily observe in your data. It's typically not something that you can open up your data set, look at the numbers, and think, hey, that's a relationship there. Instead, we need to perform inferential statistics to really identify these relationships, to really understand these relationships. And for both, we collect a sample. So what is a sample? What is a population? We already talked about this a little bit. A sample is a subset of your population, and your population is the entire group of people that you're interested in. So the population might be all the employees at a company, it might be all employees in the world. Your population is whatever group you're interested in making an inference about. And then a sample is a subset of that population. So if we're interested in all employees in America, we might just go ahead and get a sample of a few uh, randomly selected employees across the country. If we're interested in employees in Mobile, we might just go to a few companies in Mobile and get some data from those employees. And that is a subset of our population. And as I already mentioned, why do we use a sample and not a population? A sample is much more manageable. A sample you can actually collect. Typically the population is way, way, way too big to actually collect data from and to actually analyze. So therefore we collect a sample and we assume that that's a represent, or sorry, an accurate representation of our population. So that's why we collect a sample and not just a population. Okay, so that's all for the basic review. That's all I expect you to know about the general theory behind statistics at this point. Um, but let's continue to more review material and we're going to cover descriptive statistics, which like I said, I assume that you already know at least a little bit about. So what are descriptive statistics? As we said, they describe the data. They don't necessarily draw inferences about relationships, but instead you're intending to uh, understand what your data is like. You're supposed to get a good feel for your data from performing descriptive statistics. So why is it important you know descriptive statistics? So first off, most inferential statistics are built upon descriptive statistics. So later in this semester, well, pretty much the main thing we're gonna be doing all semester is learning inferential statistics. And if you don't know descriptive statistics, you can't do inferential statistics. So it helps us with what we're doing later in the semester. It can also help us understand our sample. Descriptive statistics can also help us understand our sample. So if you perform some descriptive statistics and you get the result that the average tenure of our sample of employees was 5.4 years with a standard deviation of 4.7, then that gives you a feel of what your employees are like. They're relatively, uh, they're moderately tenured. Five years is a moderate amount of time to be in a workplace. And you have a pretty good dispersion there, 4.7. Um, you're going to have some people that might have only been there a year, maybe two years. And you're going to have some people that have been there 10 years. You might even have some that have been there 15 or 20 years. But that's a pretty typical workplace. At the same time, descriptive statistics can help us understand whether something weird is going on with our sample or data. Um, so if you perform st descriptive statistics and you get a result that doesn't make any sense, you know that something weird is going on with our sample or data. 
So for instance, what if you collected a data set and your average ten tenure was 100.7? That would make no sense. Most people don't even live that long. So if the average tenure in your data was over 100 years, you would know there's something wrong with your data. And then on the other hand, what if your average tenure was 5.4 years, but the standard deviation was 20.7? Once again, that uh, dispersion, that standard deviation, doesn't really make sense given that average tenure. So you would know that something weird is going on in your data, that there might have been a wrong number in there somewhere, someone might have gave you bogus re results or bogus answers, but you would know something weird is going on. And that's why we need to know descriptive statistics, is it gives us a good feel for our data, and it lets us understand, well, do we have good data? Do we have bad data? Is there something we need to fix? And you can answer all that. Okay, so first, when learning about descriptive statistics, we're going to talk about measures of central tendency. And this gives us, these statistics give us an idea of where the center of our data set is. Where is that midpoint of our data for a certain uh, variable? So the three measures we're going to talk about are mean, median, and mode. And like I said, you probably encountered these starting in third grade, but we're going to talk about it yet again. Okay. So first off, the mean also means the average. Whenever I tell you to calculate the mean of a variable, that could also mean just calculate the average of that variable. That would mean the exact same thing. So the mean is the most popular measure of central tendency. So usually whenever we get a data set, we first start by calculating the means of all of our variables just to give us a feel for our data set, just to give us an understanding. Is there anything weird about our data set? Is there something we should understand better? We just go ahead and calculate the mean of all the variables to get a good feel. So the mean describes the most typical or most expected value of a data set. So if we were to take a random value from our data set, on average, the mean would be the best estimator of that randomly selected value. So if we had a data set and we just randomly were picking numbers from it, just always guessing the mean would be the best estimate of what that value would be. That doesn't mean a lot in practice, but it does uh, give us a little bit of an understanding of why the mean is often the best uh, estimator of central tendency. Okay, other things you should know is the mean is represented by x bar. So if you ever see a homework assignment, if you ever see anything in this class that refers to x bar, that just means the mean. And there's the formula for the mean right there if you need it, if you wanna learn more about it. I'm not gonna expect you to remember the formula in this class. Um, like I said before, we're gonna do most, most things in Excel in this class, but there's the formula right there if you really care about it. Okay. So here's a visual representation of a data set for a certain variable. Um, as you can see, the numbers go from one to seven. Most of the data falls in the middle. And if we were to calculate the mean for this data set, the dotted line is where the mean would fall. So as you can see in this example, the mean is a pretty good estimator of central tendency. It falls pretty close to where the, what we would expect the middle of this data set to be. While the mean provides the typical or expected value, in some cases the mean can also be misleading. So let's look at this exa example. In this example, it also goes from one to seven. However, our data is bimodal, that we have two different distributions going on. We have a lot of people close to one, and we have a lot of people close to seven. But if we were to calculate the mean, it would say that the middle of our data set is at the four. And while technically that could be considered the middle of our data set, there's very few people that would be accurately described by the number four. So even though that technically is the middle of our data set, the mean is a little bit misleading here, and we should think about that. And here's another example. In this data set, most of our values are one, two, or three, but we also have one person at 19 and one person at 20. And because of that, when we calculate our mean, which is once again represented by the dotted line, it's a little bit shifted over to the right, that our mean in this example is about a 2.2, and that's not really the middle of our data set. Our data set's probably, the middle of it would be better uh, represented by something like a 1.6 or a 1.7, because that's where most of our data is. Most of our data is closer to the one, one and a half range. But because we have those two outliers at 19 and 20, that shifts the mean up. That increases the mean, and that can be misleading. It could be misleading to think that the mean of our data set to the middle of our data set is around 2.2, 2.3, 
when that's not really the case. So therefore, we should uh, be knowledgeable of other measures of central tendency. And one of these other measures of central tendency is the median. So the median is the value that falls in the middle of the data set. So the median is the number that falls right in the middle of your data set. So imagine rearranging the values in your data set from smallest to largest, and then finding the value that falls right in the middle. And that is your median. So if your data set had 101 observations, you would line it up from smallest to largest and pick the one that falls with, at number 51, if I remember correctly. Um, so you would rearrange your data set from smallest to largest. You would count up until you get to right in the middle of your data set, the exact middle point, and that becomes your median. So what do you do if your median falls between two values? So what if your data set uh, has a certain number of participants or a certain number of observations where you don't really have a true middle? Your middle is between something like 50 and 51. Maybe your middle is between 10 and 11. You take the average of those two values. If you have a median, or if you try to calculate the median and there's no one number that falls right in the middle, you take the average of those two values. Fortunately, we're going to be calculating medians using Microsoft Excel. It's going to calculate it for us. It's going to provide the number for us. So you do not need to rearrange the values yourself and do all the counting. Instead, Excel will do that for you. But just know conceptually, this is what the median is. The median is rearranging your values from smallest to largest and finding that number that falls right in the middle. Okay, here's some more examples of a uh, data sets and we calculate the median. So in this example, um, if we were to rearrange the data set from smallest to largest, the number fell between 4 and 5. That the two numbers in the middle was a 4 and the other number was a 5. So therefore we calculate the median and the median of this data set is 4.5. And that looks pretty good for this data set. Um, that falls pretty close to what the center of this data set would be. So in this example, the median performed pretty well. However, going back to this example, the median once again falls victim to the same mistake that the mean made, is that most of our data is between one and seven. If we rearranged our data set from smallest to largest, the two numbers in the middle were three and five. We calculate the average of that, and we get a four. So once again, this data isn't really that well uh, described by the number four, but that's what the median was. That's what we got, so that's concerning. And then the last example, the median actually performs pretty well for this, is that even though we have those two outliers still, if we were to rearrange this data from smallest to largest, the number in the middle would be the number one, that we had that many observations at number one, that when you rearrange it from smallest to largest, the number we get in the middle was still number one. Um, and that's a pretty decent estimator of where the median would be, um, or where the center of this data set would be, as most of our data is close to one, close to two, close to three, so we want it to be shifted down there. But median's not perfect, so we should also be aware of another measure of central tendency, and that's the mode. So the mode is the number that appears the most. So you just look at your data set, you count up how many times each number appears, and the one that appears the most is the mode. Once again, we're gonna be using Excel in this class. Excel will calculate it for you, so you don't have to count it yourself, you don't have to uh, count up every value yourself. Instead, you just tell Excel to give you the mode, and it gives it to you, but this is what that number means. So if you look at the examples we used already, the mode of the first example was 4. Once again, this works out really well. This is a pretty good estimator of the central tendency of our data set, so we're happy with how the mode performs here. In this example, the mode uh, was actually two numbers. It was one and seven. So both one and seven appeared 40 times in our data set. So they're both the mode. You can get more than one mode. And that describes this data set pretty well. It's bimodal. We see if there's two different modes, it works well. And then also the mode in the last example was number one. The number one appeared the most in our data set. So our mode is one. That works out pretty well once again. Um, so in these examples, the mode worked out pretty well. I will say, however, typically in practice, we almost always start by calculating the mean. On average, the mean works the best as our measure of central tendency. And I'll say that once again. On average, the mean works best as the measure of central tendency. 
However, if we think our data might be skewed, if we think our data might have a weird shape, if we think our data might be all clustered around the number one and there's very few people in the rest of the numbers, maybe the data, instead of looking like a bell curve, which you should have encountered already, instead of looking like a bell curve, it might instead have a bimodal distribution or something like that. We would also calculate the median. The median is pretty resilient to non-normal distributions. So we first calculate the mean. If we think our data is skewed, we would then also calculate the median and provide both. And then to be honest, we rarely calculate the mode. Um, often our mode value doesn't really tell us a lot. Often the number that appears in the most in the data set isn't really that informative. But we might calculate it sometimes. You might find it useful in certain situations. So you should know how to use it. You should know how to calculate it. So therefore, in some situations, we might calculate the mode. OK, so that's all for uh, measures of central tendency. Now we're going to move on to descriptive statistics, measures of dispersion. So in addition to knowing where the center of our data is located, we're often interested in how spread apart our data is. So we're not only wanting to know where the center of our data is, but we want to know whether that data is clustered together at that center, whether it's really close together at wherever that center value is, or our data could be spread apart. It could be that very few values are at our center and instead all of our values are really spread apart. So in the prior examples, we had some that everything was really close to the number one, really close to the number two or three. And then we had the other example where everything was at a, either a one or a seven, and they were really spread apart. And it would be really helpful if we had a numerical indicator of that, if we could calculate a number that could do that. Fortunately, there is. So from knowing the central tendency and dispersion of our data, we can get a decent sense of what our data looks like without needing to plot it in a graph. So hopefully by the end of this course, if you just calculate the mean, the median, and a measure of dispersion, you should be able to pretty quickly understand what your data looks like. You shouldn't need to graph it. You should instead just be able to think, okay, I can understand what the center is. I can understand how spread apart the data is. It's often still really helpful to graph it, but you should be able to understand what your data is like just by looking at those numbers. Okay, the first measure of dispersion we're gonna look at is the range. The first one we're gonna look at is the range. So the range is really, really, really simple. The range is the minimum, sorry, that should say the maximum observed value subtracted by the minimum observed value. So that's a typo on the slide, make sure you note that. So the range is the maximum observed value subtracted by the minimum observed value. So the range is the max minus the min. So you take the largest value in your data set for a variable, subtracted by the smallest value in your data set for that variable. Honestly, the range doesn't really help all that much in many situations, because it doesn't tell you whether all the values are spread apart. You might just have one value that's spread apart, but it's still helpful to know what the range is. So let's look at these same examples again. So look at this and try to figure out if you can calculate the range. I'll give you a second. Okay, you should have got the number six. So in this example, the highest value was seven. So the highest data number in our data set was a seven, and the smallest was a one. The smallest value in our data set was a one. Um, so we would take seven minus one, that gives us six. So the range of this data set is six. Okay, what about this example? This data looks very different, so I'll give you a second to calculate the range. Okay, so even though this data set was very different, although it's shaped very differently, the range was the same. It was number six. So as you see, the largest value in this data set is a seven. The smallest is a one. So seven minus one is six. So the range of this data set was six. So as you can see already, that's one of the problems with the range is your data sets might look very different, they might have very different properties, but the range might give you the same value. Kind of concerning. Okay, so let's look at this one again. I'll give you a second to calculate the range in your head. Okay, so as you probably guessed, once again, although this data set looks very different, the range was yet again the number six. We had one person who got a seven in this data set, so they're the largest value, so we take that seven, we subtract the one, and once again we get six. So in each of these examples, although the data set looks very different, we got the number six for all of those. And you probably should have seen a problem with this. 
you probably should have realized, hey, that doesn't really make sense. The data had different, uh, different clustering. Some of them were more spread apart. Some of them were closer together. But the range gave you the number six for all of those. And that's concerning. Fortunately, there are much, much, much better measures of dispersion. And you probably should have encountered them in your prior stats courses. The two we're going to talk about in this class are variance and standard deviation. So variance measures how far each number in your data set is from it, the mean of that variable. So it gives you an indicator of how far on average each number in your data set is from the mean of that variable in your data set. So each variable in your data set will have one variance value. So if your data set has the variables job satisfaction, job performance, uh, conscientiousness, things like that, you can get a variance value for job satisfaction. You can get a variance value for job performance. You can get a variance value for conscientiousness. So every measure variable in the data set will have one variance value. And technically, the variance is the average of the squared differences between each observation in the data set for that variable and the mean for that variable. So you just calculate the mean, you subtract each observation from the mean, and then you square all those differences and add them up. Once again, I'm not going to make you learn how to do that by hand in this course. Excel will do it for you. There's no reason to do it by hand when computers can do it for you like that. But you should at least have a general idea of what the variance is. Okay, and then also standard deviation also measures how far each number in the set is from the mean. And once again, each variable with variable within a data set will have one standard deviation value. So very, very, very similar to variance. In fact, the standard deviation is just the square root of the variance. So to get the standard deviation, you calculate the variance, and then you take the square root of the variance to get the standard deviation. Once again, Excel will just go ahead and give you the standard deviation. It will just go ahead and give it to you. You don't have to do the calculation yourself, which is very convenient. So one thing that's convenient about the standard deviation is it returns the value back to the original unit of measurement. So when you calculate the variance, when you get the variance value, it's really hard to interpret. It's not really on the same scale as whatever, whatever variable you're looking at. However, your standard deviation is back on the original unit of measurement of whatever variable you're looking at. So if you're looking at revenue for a company, the standard deviation will automatically relate to dollar values. If you're looking at the employee ages in your company and you measured it by years, the standard deviation will automatically be in regards to years. So it's very, very, very useful. Standard deviation, as long as you know what the variable is, you can easily interpret it. You can quickly know, oh, it's a standard deviation of three. That means it's a standard deviation of three years if we're looking at age and we measured it in years. So standard deviation is extremely useful because it's already in the unit of measurement that the variable was measured in. Very useful, very easy. So because of that, standard deviation is the most popular measure of dispersion. Um, so when I do research, when I do consulting work, um, I almost always am given or I provide the mean, the median, and the standard deviation of the variables in the data set right off the bat. Um, people tend to expect that. People tend to like that. So at a minimum, you should always know how to calculate the mean, the median, and the standard deviation of a variable in regards to calculating descriptive statistics. That's very often expected in both research and consulting work, at least in the field of business. Okay, something else interesting about the normal distribution is if we assume our data has a certain shape, then we can estimate where the values fall for our data. So if we can assume that our data has a certain distribution, we can estimate where the data falls for that variable. And the most common assumption about the shape of our data is the normal distribution, which is also called the bell curve. So you probably have already encountered the bell curve. This is a more complicated figure of it. Um, hopefully in your last stats class you at least saw this somewhat. So if you assume that your data has a bell curve shape, you can then estimate based on standard deviations where your data falls. So let's look at this easier version of the bell curve. So in this example, as you can see, uh, one standard deviation, so we have a negative one standard deviation, which is the negative one sigma. We have one standard deviation, which is the one sigma. So if we assume a normal distribution for our data, which we often do, if we assume a normal distribution for our data, 
we can then assume that about 68.2% of our data falls within one standard deviation. And that's pretty helpful. That gives us a good idea of what our data looks like. And then also if we assume a normal distribution, we can then assume about 95.4% of our data falls within two standard deviations. And you can see that from negative two sigma, negative two standard deviations, to positive two sigma, positive two standard deviations. And then if we assume that our data has a normal distribution, we can then assume that 99.7% of our data falls within three standard deviations. So from negative three to positive three standard deviations. And that's pretty much all of our data. So if we assume a normal distribution, we calculate the mean, which is right in the middle with that uh, Greek uh, symbol mu. So if we calculate the mean, it's right in the middle. And then if we calculate the standard deviation and we assume a normal distribution, we can assume that 68% fall within negative one to one standard deviation, 95.4 fall between negative two and positive two standard deviations, and then 99.7% of our data falls within negative three to positive three standard deviations from our mean. So if this is confusing with you, go ahead, pause the video, look at this figure a little bit more, maybe look at the prior slide. If you're still confused, feel free to send me an email. I'm always happy to explain these concepts. Um, I really like talking about statistics. I'm always happy to talk about statistics as much as I can. So if you're confused about this, feel free to pause this video and ask me questions about it. Okay, so continuing. So if we uh, assume a normal distribution, if we use a normal distribution, we can therefore estimate where most of the values land. So if we collected a data, it doesn't matter what the data is, but if we collected data and we had a mean of five and a standard deviation of one, Assuming a normal distribution, we can then get a good sense of what particular observations mean. We can then get a good sense of what particular observations, uh, how they relate to the broader sample. So for instance, if we have a mean of five and a standard deviation of one, and a particular observation had a value of three, we would know that's pretty far below the mean. We would know that they fall in the bottom about 5% of our data, based on that normal distribution on the prior slide. If we also got a different observation that had a value of five, we would know that's right dead in the center, that they're above about 50% of our data, and they're also below about 50% of our data, they fall right in the middle. And then the last one, if we had a particular observation that had a value of eight, we would know that they're a huge extreme, that our mean is five, our standard deviation is one, a value of eight is three standard deviations above the mean, so we would know that they're in the top 0.3% of our data. They're above 99.7 of our observations. So we would know that they're a huge, uh, not necessarily an outlier at that point, but they're still at the top of our distribution. They're doing pretty well for themselves. And just based on assuming the normal distribution, which we often do, and knowing the mean and standard deviation, we can get good feel for our data. We can get good senses of what all that means. So in practice, a lot of data generally falls in this distribution, but not all. And it's very important that you understand that. Um, not all of our data falls in a normal distribution. And it's often very problematic to make large decisions by norming, sorry, by assuming the normal distribution. So if you ever have to make a big business decision, if you have to make a big consulting decision, make sure you chart your data first. Make sure you plot your data first. And try to get a good sense, well, is your data normal? Does your data fit the normal distribution? because if it doesn't and you assume the normal distribution, you can have huge problems, huge issues can arise. So think about that as you continue in this class. Okay, so let's think about some more examples. So let's say you're looking at age and you collected a uh, data set, you collected some data and this is the age of the data set, the mean was 20 and the standard deviation is one. What could you probably say about the data set? What would you automatically assume about that data set? You probably guessed it. You're probably looking at college students. If the average age of your data set is 20 and the standard deviation is one, that means most of your data set falls between the ages of about 18 to 22, prime college ages. So if you have a data set with a mean of 20 for the age, a standard deviation of one for the age, you're probably looking at college students. Okay, what about this one? You have a mean of 70 and a standard deviation of 10. Okay, in this example, most of your data, most of the ages in your data set probably fall between about 50 and 90. Um, you might be looking at 
uh, I don't know, a retirement home. You might be looking at an older population. Um, but you would know that the, you're looking at a specialized population. You're looking at a population that's different from the general population. They're much older, and your ages go to pretty far extremes. Okay, what about this one? A mean of 45 and a standard deviation of 10. Okay, in this one you're probably looking at a general employed data set, a general data set of employees, um, because on average the people are, you know, 45, they're normal uh, middle working age. Most of your data is going to go from about 25 to 65, um, so that's the prime working age for most adults in America. Um, so you're probably just looking at a normal employee data set. And you can get that inference just from looking at the mean and standard deviation. Okay, and then how about this one? A mean of 45 and a standard deviation of 100. And if you had this, you would probably think that there's something weird going on with your data. It doesn't really make sense for the standard deviation to be so high when the mean is 45. Um, this would imply that your ranges of ages go from negative something to over 200. Um, so if you have a mean of 45 and a standard deviation of 100 for ages, you would probably assume something weird is going on in your data. Okay, let's look at the same type of thing for grades. So if we had a class that had a mean of 95 and a standard deviation of 5, what would you say about that class? You're probably right. You probably said that it's going to be a super easy class, that most of the grades went from about um, an 85 to 100. Um, if the limit was 100, you could still get a standard deviation of 5. It would be a skewed data set. You probably shouldn't assume the normal distribution, but we're going to ignore that for now. So if you had a mean of 95 and a standard deviation of 5, the grades are probably somewhere between an 85 and 100. So it's a pretty easy class. Okay, so what about this example? A class with a uh, grade average of 85 with a standard deviation of 5. And this one's probably a pretty average class. Most of the student grades are going to be between 75 and 95. You'll probably have a few a little bit higher than that, a few lower than that. But that's a pretty typical class. That's about what we would expect. Okay. And in this example, a mean of 75 and a standard deviation of 10. And this would be a much harder class that, yeah, you would have a range of about 55 to 95. You do have some people, you know, in an A range, but that's a pretty low average, and you have probably quite a lot of people that failed the class. Um, so this would be a much harder class. And you can interpret that just by looking at the mean and standard deviations of the grades. Okay, so let's look at another example. So in this data, or in these data sets, we have employee salaries. So let's say that you have employee salaries in your data set. The mean is $50,000 and a standard deviation of $10,000. You're probably looking at pretty average employees, probably pretty average blue collar uh, workers, you know, make $50,000 standard deviation of 10. So their salaries probably typically go from about 30,000 to 70,000 if we're assuming a normal distribution. So a pretty typical workplace. What about this one? A mean of 125,000 and a standard deviation of 25,000. So if this was our data set, we're probably looking at some type of executives. We're probably looking at some type of upper management positions. So our data set's going to have wealthy people. But their salaries are going to range probably from about 75000 to 175000 So they're going to be wealthier employees. Um, so we're looking at a wealthier data set. Um, maybe, Silicon, or sorry, maybe Silicon Valley engineers. Maybe Silicon Valley computer scientists. Maybe managers. Maybe executives. So on and so on. Okay. And then what about this one, mean of 12,000, standard deviation of zero. So if this was your data set, you would probably either expect there to be some type of mistake, or you're looking at a very specialized data set. Um, this example actually comes from graduate student salaries at a university. Um, so there was a particular university that I was looking at at one point, where every grad student, no matter who they were, made $12,000 a year. So in that case, the mean was 12,000, because that was the only value. And the standard deviation was zero, because no one made anything other than $12,000. So if you found this in a data set that you weren't expecting it, you would probably say, well, there's something weird going on. But because I expected that to happen in the data set, because I knew that no one made anything other than $12,000, then I knew I did the right thing. I knew I collected my data correctly. So 
So those are some examples. Uh, if you're still confused, feel free to pause, rewind the video, try it again, or shoot me an email. Because it's very important you know these concepts, because your homework will require you to calculate measures of central tendency and dispersion. So for your homework, I'll give you a data set. I'll send you a little Excel how-to guide. You should go through the how-to guide first. You should make sure you understand how to calculate it first ahead of time. And then you do it yourself on the data set I provide for the homework. So the homework, I'll give you a data set and tell you to calculate the measures of central tendency and dispersion, and that's going to be it. So make sure you understand these concepts pretty well before continuing. Um, and if you're confused about anything, shoot me an email. I'm happy to chat, but I should have sent you an email already. It gives you instructions, it gives you the how-to guide, and tells you how to access your homework. And also make sure you get started early. The homework for this class is going to be due Sundays at 11.55 at night, so right before midnight. So make sure you don't wait till the last minute. Make sure you get started early, do your homework before then. Okay, and then the last topic of this review is p-values. The last topic of this review is going to be p-values. And once again, I've expe I expect that you've already encountered this topic. I expect that you already know a little bit about this topic. So we're not going to cover it super in-depth because I expect you to generally know it already. Okay, so whenever we do inferential statistics, which we'll be learning later in the semester, whenever we calculate any type of inferential statistic, we have a hypothesis. And we already talked about this earlier in this lecture. We have some type of hypothesis. So for example, our hypothesis might be pretty simple, such as a relationship exists between job satisfaction and job performance. So our hypothesis might just be simply a relationship exists between job satisfaction and job performance. Whenever we propose a hypothesis, we therefore also have an implied null hypothesis. What is a null hypothesis? It just says that no relationship exists. It just says that no effect is going on. So an implied null hypothesis in this example would be that no relationship exists between job satisfaction and job performance. So our hypothesis, a relationship exists. Null hypothesis, no relationship exists. So p-values tell us the likelihood of obtaining our observed results if we assume the null hypothesis is true. So what this is saying is whenever we perform inferential statistics, it will give us a p-value, and it says assuming there's no effect, this is the likelihood of obtaining our observed results. So assuming the null hypothesis is true, this is the likelihood of obtaining what we did obtain. So if our p-value is really small, if it's 0.01, then that says there was only a 1% chance of obtaining these results if no effect was actually going on, if our null hypothesis is true. On the other hand, if our p-value is really high, if our p-value is 0.95, then it's saying that there was a 95% chance of obtaining these results assuming the null hypothesis is true, assuming there's actually no effect going on. So using this logic, if we can say that the observed results were very unlikely if we assume the null hypothesis is true, we can then reject the null hypothesis. So if we say that our observed results were very unlikely, so if we get a p-value of something like 0.01, if we say there is only a 1% chance of observing this if the null hypothesis is true, then we can reject the null. We can support our hypothesis. We can say there's probably an effect going on because it was so unlikely to observe this if there was no effect, we therefore assume an effect. We therefore reject the null hypothesis. So if we can say that our observed results were very unlikely, if we assume the null hypothesis is true, we then reject the null hypothesis. And to do this, we use a 0.95 level of significance. So in other words, we only want to reject the null hypothesis if our data had a smaller than 5% chance to occur if the null hypothesis is true. So when we perform our analyses, when we do inferential statistics, we look at our p-value. If our p-value is less than 0.05, we then reject the null. And that's extremely important for you to know. If you missed that, pause the video, rewind it, listen to it again. We perform our inferential statistics, we get a p-value. If our p-value is less than 0.05, we then therefore say the null hypothesis was unlikely to be true. It was unlikely to get this data if our null hypothesis is true. So therefore, if we get a p-value of less than 0.05, we reject the null, and we then assume that our hypothesis is correct. We then assume that we 
made a good hypothesis, we made a good prediction. So we're always looking for that less than 0.05. We're always hoping that our p-value is less than 0.05 because then we can reject the null. Okay, so let's look at this example. So for example, let's say that we tested whether the population mean is significantly different than zero. So to do so, we collected a sample, performed the relevant analysis, and received a p-value of 0.03. So that's our example. So first off, what is the null hypothesis? What is the null hypothesis? So in this example, the null hypothesis is that the population mean is zero. So it's saying that there's no effect going on. The null hypothesis is there's no effect. So it's saying the population mean is zero. It's saying it's not significantly different from zero. It's saying that it is zero. So the null hypothesis, no effect. It's saying that the population mean is zero in this example. Uh, whenever you perform inferential statistics, the null hypothesis is going to differ based on that statistic. But it's always that there's no effect. It's always that the effect is zero. So if it's a correlation, the correlation is zero. If it's a t-test, it's that the t-statistic is zero. In this example, it's that the population mean is zero. Okay, so in this example, what is the p-value telling us? So in this example, the p-value is telling us if we assume that the population mean is zero, then the likelihood of observing the data that we collected, so the likelihood of getting the data or getting the results from the sample that we collected, was only a 3% chance. It's saying that assuming the population mean is zero, the likelihood of obtaining our results from our sample was only a 3% chance. It's saying it's super small, that's a very small chance. So therefore, should we accept or reject the null? In this example, we should reject the null. So the p-value we got was less than 0.05, that's a pretty small chance, so we should reject the null. We should say that since that was such a small chance of occurring, the null is probably not accurate. The null is probably not the effect that's really going on. So we can reject the null because our p-value is less than 0.05. And then what would our interpretation be if we got these results? Our interpretation would be that since we could reject the null, the population mean probably is significantly different from zero. We can say our population mean probably is something different from zero. So we can reject the null, we can say the population mean probably is significantly different from zero. Okay, so once again, this is just the quick, the thing you have to know for this class, the thing you absolutely should know moving forward, is in general, we just interpret p-values, is if the p-value is less than 0.05, then the effect is statistically significant. So we say that the effect that we're looking for is actually observed in our data. So if the p is less than 0.05, the effect is statistically significant. If the p-value is greater than 0.05, if the p-value is more than 0.05, if the p-value is greater than 0.05, the effect is not statistically significant. The effect is not statistically significant. So if the p-value is greater than 0.05, the effect is not statistically significant. So we would say that the null hypothesis, we could not reject it. Our hypothesis, we cannot assume it. The one that we proposed, we cannot assume that our hypothesis is true. So we would say that the effect is not statistically significant, and we cannot reject the null hypothesis if the p-value is greater than 0.05. Okay. So last thing is also take a quick look at these numbers and try to figure out which of the following are statistically significant. So take a quick look and try to figure out which of the following are statistically significant. Okay, so the first one, 0 .000001, that is statistically significant. That is much smaller than 0.05. So we would say that the first one is statistically significant. The second one, 0 .10, we would say that's not statistically significant. That is greater than 0 0.05. 0 0.1 is greater than 0 0.05. So we'd say that is statistically significant. The third one, 0 0.5. Sorry, let me back up. I think I just made a mistake in what I said on the last one. So number two, 0 0.1, that is greater than 0 0.05. So we would say it's not statistically significant. So last one, 0 0.1, that is greater than 0 0.05. So we'd say that is not statistically significant. Okay, back on track. 
the third one, 0.5, we would say that is also not statistically significant. So 0.5 is much greater than 0.05, so we would say that is not statistically significant. Okay. The fourth one, 0.3, once again 0.3 is greater than 0.05, so we would say that is not statistically significant. The next one, 0.03, that is a little bit smaller than 0.05. So because 0.03 is smaller than 0.05, we would say that is statistically significant. So because 0.03 is smaller than 0.05, we would say that is statistically significant. The next one, 0.001, what did you think about that one? Again, that is smaller than 0.05, so it is statistically significant. 0.001 is smaller than 0.05, so we'd say that our results are statistically significant and we can reject the null hypothesis. The next one, 0.02, once again is smaller than 0.05, so we would support our results. We could reject the null hypothesis because 0.02 is smaller than 0.05. And the very last one, 0.051, could you guess it? Hopefully you're right, 0.051 is a tiny, tiny, tiny bit larger than 0.05. 0.051 is a tiny, tiny, tiny bit larger than 0.05, so therefore that is not statistically significant. For something to be statistically significant, it must be smaller than 0.05. 0.051 is larger, so therefore it is not statistically significant. Okay, so if you're still confused, I have a website, it's mattchoward.com, and I like to make statistical help guides. I make guides to help students learn statistics. Um, I use it a lot for my classes. If you're still confused about p-values, check out mattchoward.com. And the email I sent you this week, I probably already included a link to this website. Um, you're going to use it for your stats guides when you have to calculate the stats in Excel. So make sure you check out mattchoward.com. There's two guides on p-values, actually. If you're still confused about this, they can probably help you out. So that's all for this week on the lectures. Make sure you go through the statistics guide on how to calculate descriptive statistics in Excel. That's going to be extremely helpful. And then don't forget the homework. Make sure you do the homework assignment this week. I know it's the first week of class. I know you already hate me for giving a homework assignment already, but make sure you do it. You do have a homework assignment. All right, that's all until next week. I will talk to you then.